listeners of Affect Autism and Parent Perspectives get 25% off my upcoming course, DIR 120, Choosing Play, Setting Up Success Across the Lifespan, using the promo code 2023 We Chose Play 25. That's 2023 W E C H O S E P L A Y 25. Live online Fridays from noon until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, starting Friday, November 3rd, going through to December 15th, with no class the week of American Thanksgiving. In this six-week course, participants will review season one of my floor time documentary, We Chose Play, and discuss each episode, including review, Q&A, reflection, and action steps to support your floor time experience. You're listening to Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Daria Brown, and this week I'm very excited to have this panel on VISPA. What is VISPA? Colette Ryan joins me this week. She is an expert DIR training leader, developmental individual differences relationship-based model with the International Council on Development and Learning, ICDL. She is the coordinator for their mentoring program. She's also a New York State endorsed infant mental health therapist and an infant mental health fellow at Montclair State University in New Jersey. And she's in the process of completing her PhD on parent self-efficacy with Fielding University. She is joining us from Japan today. I also welcome back Tony Tortora, who is also a DIR expert training leader. She's also an occupational therapist and the clinical director at the Rebecca School and she joins us from Manhattan. Colleen Gabbert is a first-time Affect Autism podcast guest. She's also a DIR expert and training leader and an occupational therapist, and she is the occupational therapy supervisor at the DIR Floor Time Rebecca School in Manhattan. So we are (laughs) here today to discuss VISPA, which is the Visual Spatial Planning and Assessment Tool. And this is a book that has activities in it, which we're going to talk about in a second. So the VISPA tool helps clinicians know where to start and end off with activities from this book. So I will link to the podcast I did about this book in the podcast for today. Uh, Who wants to go first and describe what this book is about and what this VISPA tool is about and how it came about? Daria, maybe we should talk about why we decided to do this podcast way back in 2020 when we were meeting with parents virtually, and we were discussing um, tools that families, parents, um, individuals could do at home, and this is a very user-friendly set of activities that you can do anywhere with any materials. You don't need this ginormous toolkit or this bag or this training. Um, Dr. Rax and Dr. and Hans Firth wrote Thinking Goes to School book. And if you take a look at it, it's a lot of information and it's a, it's a narrative um, and it's great information, but it doesn't kind of give you the where to start or where to end if you don't have that clinical background. It's a little bit hard to do. So what we did quite a few years ago at the Rebecca School is we sent someone from the Rebecca School to meet with Dr. Wax and organize these um, activities. So they met regularly for months and came up with the VISPA. And that's kind of what we use to say, oh, this student needs this targeted activity to work on X, Y, and Z. And this is where we start. And this is this is the trajectory to go. And it's helpful because as an occupational therapist, I can say, oh, this is what needs to be worked on. This is where the support is needed. But then I can hand it over to the classroom staff or a parent and say, these this is what you do next. Once you've once you've accomplished this part, this is the next thing to go to. And it, it lays it all out for you. And and Tony, tell us more about why it was important at that time for parents. Yeah. So during COVID, it was it was hard. <laughs> it's hard for everybody to get therapy, to get um OTs, PTs. Mm-hmm. parents were saying what do we do and how do we continue to support our children's development while 
we're home. Um, so I jumped on a couple of collect groups and parent parent support groups, and I was talking a lot about thinking goes to school and the VISPA because it is it is e it's easy to do and it's user friendly and anybody mm -hmm. can do it, which makes it really really applicable to um, mm -hmm. to every population. The other important thing to remember is that it's not um, these very challenging activities right this is these activities are all what we think of as like pre-academic activities mm -hmm. they're activities that you want to work on and practice with kids that are working at those pre-academic levels so and supporting the academic levels through it so it sounds like a little bit of both but um parents were interested in how to, and how to do this at home. And that's, that's kind of where, where we started. Did I answer your question, Colette? You, you did. And I think it's interesting when we think about the VISPA and, and how um, down to earth it is and, mm -hmm. and it supports parents in feeling successful. It's not like a multi-step activity that they have to go out and buy materials for. These are things that you can do and you have the materials for around your house. And so right. parents can feel successful. And I think that's, for me, that's the important part. Yeah, and I think that like thinking goes to school and the VISPA working together also lends itself to helping parents and families understand foundational skills and how closely different systems are working together that lead to academic successes or milestones being met. So for me as a occupational therapist at Rebecca School and of course working with Tony, it also gives us a way to talk to families and say, look, but if we work on all these thinking school skills, sorry, thinking skills and movement-based activities, we're going to see development in fine motor skills and handwriting skills and really bridge the gap between visual motor skills, handwriting skills and fine motor skills, but also body awareness and how we're interacting with the environment in a, in the home setting, in the school setting, really wherever you are. Yeah, and the activities are, are hands off from the clinician or therapeutic perspective, right? The person who's doing the activity, the child, the young adult, the adult who who is who is doing the thinking goes to school activity is the person who's in charge and in control because that's where the thinking comes from. And we, I wish maybe one day I will be a neuroscientist and I can get into someone's brain and I can see the thinking happening, but I can't see the thinking happening. So the only way that we can see thinking is from their motor plans, from, from people's motor plans. And that's why not putting your hands on students and letting them motor plan, even if it's the littlest finger up is the first step, that mm -hmm. to me shows, oh, they're thinking, right? And some, if you're not in the DIR world, you may not think that that's thinking, but I know that this is thinking, right? Getting that finger to move mm -hmm. towards something or gaze at something. Those mm -hmm. skills are just as important as climbing the obstacle course. Mm -hmm. So I, I because, feel, oh, go ahead, Colette. And, I, I, and because I'm not an, an OT, though I play one, or <laughs> I, I'm not an OT, though I play one on TV, I think is the same. <laughs> um, I, can you tell me why those visual spatial skills are important? Yes. And Colleen mentioned before systems as well. And I think that's important to talk about are um, what systems we're talking about, right? The sensory systems and how the sensory systems and the motor systems kind of work together. So we do have, oh boy, we have five sensory systems that we all know and love that we probably learn some at some point in grammar school, right? Touch, taste, vision, smell, and hearing. Sight. Oh my goodness, hearing. <laughs> oh, sight. We all can count to five it's too early in the morning or too late at night, depending on where you are. Um, and then we have vestibular and probe, which are our two sensory systems that we know control a lot of our movements and have a lot to do with our reflexes and our orientation to our body and space and gravity and things like that. And she's and then talking our about proprioception. Yes. You said probe. I just wanted to specify. Proprioception. <laughs> and um, 
the last one, the eighth one, the the newest trend, even though it's not that new, interoception and understanding kind of what your body's feeling. So thinking about all of these sensory systems working together, then when we get information from our environment, our brain then does something with it. And what it does is what we can see. Um, movement, um, reacting, turning around to see something if you hear a noise behind you um, or not, right? There's a door closing outside of my office, but I'm focused on this podcast right now. And even though I hear the door, I know I'm not not nervous or or unsafe, so I can keep focus here. So th- that's what our sensory systems allow us to do. And those systems have to work together in order for us to be able to do what some teachers expect students to do sit at a table, look at a desk, hold their pencil, ignore the kid behind them that's poking them or humming or doing whatever. You should see these kindergarten classrooms. Um, And then follow a lesson, right? Look up at the board, look down at their paper, write something down, think about what they have to write before writing it down and then form the letters and do perfect handwriting because that's what you're supposed to do at five years old in um, New York City schools. It's, It's a lot, we ask a lot. And thinking about our sensory systems and why they're so important, if you can't do one of those things that I just named, then one of your sensory systems is not integrated with the other ones, or maybe more than one, which then leads to this delay. And it's labeled with this these gross words. I don't mean gross like dirty. I mean like very vague <laughs> words of a, a d- developmental delay or a diagnosis or speech and language delay, when really it's something about the sensory systems that isn't integrated with the rest of the systems which then is is causing the student to not be able to look up at the board and look down at their paper or hold their pencil correctly or ignore the kid that's humming behind them in order to focus on what the teacher is saying. So all of those things have to work together. And what thinking goes to school does is say, hey, we know something, we know something's not quite right. We're going to work to integrate those sensory systems. And here are some activities to kind of get you to work on those. And like what it does differently than most other interventions is it looks at the whole child as a thinking being and someone who learns through play versus many times in a New York City school system, if a student is forming their letters incorrectly or struggling with fine motor skills, they'll be referred to occupational therapy and often get worksheets to practice handwriting, a special a special grip to like try and move their grip along. And really it's only giving them maybe a splinter skill. I won't say it's completely ineffective. It's not the approach that I would take or that we use here at Rebecca School, but it's not looking at the underlying cause for the challenge that the student is experiencing. Whereas when you, then you look at the VISPA and thinking goes to school, you're really looking at the whole person, which I think is why it also works so nicely as DIR floor time practitioners, because that's, you know, in our belief system already. So it really goes hand in hand with, with our approach. I just want to jump in for any parents that are listening and, you know, they're getting curious about this and we're going to talk about, we're going to give examples for sure. But I just want to sort of backtrack and just say a few things, refer people to some other podcasts that I'll link to in the blog post. I have a podcast on foundation academics, which describes what Tony talks about, these precursors to academics, the um, early functional, emotional, developmental capacities that the DIR model covers that typical children tend to move through the first six before they go to kindergarten. But a lot of our kids, um, my autistic son, still working through those early capacities. Um, The other thing you mentioned were, you know, sort of precursors to fine motor skills and things like that. And um, I did a podcast with uh, an occupational therapist, Keith Landhair, and he talked about that, how parents come in and they'll say, my goal is this, and they'll see them working on play and other things and say, you know, get frustrated and how he had to learn how to translate for parents that these are the things that the child needs to develop that system in order to be able to develop those fine motor skills and sort of that um, bridge for parents. 
Um, I also just wanted to talk about the, you mentioned the sensory systems. I'll refer people back to the, the I in the DIR model, the individual differences and in sensory processing profile. Uh, I have a checklist that people can look through and, and sort of understand your child's profile. And so when DIR looks at the whole child, we're looking like, where are they on these functional emotional developmental capacities? Where are they on their individual differences? What, what do we need to look at? And then these activities, using them in a playful way to sort of help children, um, you know, get to that place. And, and it couldn't be more perfect timing because my son is now 14 and, you know, he, he still struggles with handwriting a lot and he struggles with different things. And, and I've done a, a number of podcasts with occupational therapist, Maude LaRue, that talk, who talks about exactly what Tony just said. If all these sensory systems aren't working together and how can we get them to work together? And it's such a good supplement to kids who are in school, you know, where the goals are academic, um, but working on these precursors. So parents are sitting at the edges of their seat, listening to this podcast or watching on YouTube say, what can I do with my child that isn't super complicated, but really helps work on these skills? And Tony, you can let me know when to share screen. Like if you want to go through and give a couple of examples, um, I can pull up the VISPA again. Sure. Let's pull it up to uh, magic buttons. That's my favorite one to describe. Colleen, you said something that I think is is so important is that we're many times families think that kiddos need to learn tasks. They They need to know how to hold the pencil. They need to know um you know how to position themselves and we very frequently have parents looking for drills looking for tell me what tell me how to get this done and and the activities sometimes are not integrated into the the child's developmental capacity or their interests so i think another thing that i like about the vispa is that we can make it each one of these games, we can make them purposeful. It's not like, okay, you're going to sit down and you're going to do your drills now on the letter A, but, and, and then kiddos go, okay, I did that. I don't know how to use it now. I think these, the, the VISPA tasks and games, they give that purpose. They give the reason why I'm doing this. And the thing is fun that I'm doing um, and I don't realize I just worked on my A's, if if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like in that sense, it also allows families and teachers and, you know, people working with kids to get creative and bring in passions and interests so that kids are motivated and engaged and want to be doing magic buttons. It, I think we'll talk about that first, which is, it is a fan favorite at Rebecca's school. Um, page page could be, 68, Daria, if that helps you get to it. It could be done in so many different ways and individualized in a thousand more for anyone. And, and that's where the affect is going to be, mm -hmm. is in an activity that, mm -hmm. that your child likes. And you know we know that affect is what motivates us to want to do the hard stuff. And if these activities are hard, but we're using a lot of affect and we're using all yellow balls because we know our kiddos love yellow. Okay, well, now it's more motivating for me to do this work with balls because they're my favorite color. Right. It's hard not to get, I mean, I feel like we could go on a thousand different tangents, right? But that emotionally meaningful activity mm -hmm. And the dual coding of sensory information and the emotional experience, now we're going to have a way longer lasting effect instead of just splinter skill or like, oh, he held the pencil right for two minutes, say, or she or they. And now we're going to see, oh, look, they're scanning in the environment and are following a two-step directive across mm -hmm. many different activities versus just focusing on one skill. Absolutely. Yeah, so if we take a look at the magic buttons, um, there are so many different ways that you can do it. This is why it's one of our favorite things because 
you can build the anticipation, you can use your affect and you become the toy, right? Like we actually are what Dr. Greenspan said to be. So this is why it's specifically one of our favorites. So what I usually do with this is um, I put up one of my students that I've been working with really loves animals. So I, and duct tape, not duct tape, um, painter's tape is one of my favorite thing, one of my ther okay. favorite therapy tools. It's easy to use. So I use my painter's tape and I use um, animal cards, just pictures of animals. You could print them off the internet. I actually use, um, it's like a, a go fish type of game, but it's all <laughs> different animals. So I use a deck of cards and I tape them up to the wall. And again, you can put them down in front of the student on the paper in front of them. That's probably a little bit more challenging than if you put them up on a wall so that they are looking at it straight in front of them. And you start off, I usually put three or four um, different animals up there, tape them to the wall. And then I say, touch the... Um, touch the the monkey. So the student touched the monkey. And then I say, touch the lion. Touch the, um, I can't think of animals, touch the alligator, right? And we, and I go through all them. So I make sure we have a shared meaning of what the, all the animals are, because sometimes I'll touch the alligator. They'll be like, I don't see an alligator, right? So you want to make sure that whatever's up there, that you have that shared meaning first. Then you increase the increase the uh, level of difficulty. You'll say touch monkey, then alligator, and the student does it. And when they do it, you turn into whatever it is that lights that student up. So sometimes I'm a monster, right? And I chase them around the gym, or sometimes I fall asleep if they get the the correct code and they unlock the the sleeping monster. Or sometimes it is um our you do it twice and you have to race to the other end of the room and race back for my students who need a little bit more movement and can't stand still right away to, to again, to do the next one. And you keep adding on um, the level of difficulty by, you could change the, the spaces the animals are in, you can say it in different orders, you can do two and three and four and, and keep going. And this really helps build that working, that working memory also while adding in that auditory and visual component. And again, you're looking for the motor plan, right? My hand's not on the child's hand saying, touch this, do this. That's not what it is. It's about the child, even if they can just pick up one finger. So if they're if they're only able to lift one finger, then moving them a little bit closer or putting them down on the table or laying them on the floor may be easier for them than versus getting their hand up um, to point. So those are those are some of the activities that we work on with that. And then sometimes if the animal is on a color, I can make it even harder by talking about the color of the card. And then they have to kind of forget the animals on it and work with a different part of, of their thinking and their initiation. So there, there's so many different ways that that we can that we can do mm. this. Um, so, Tony, can words? can, yeah, can we um, so I'm the parent listening and yes. I'm going to ask the question specific to my child. So, you know, my son is now 14 and, you know, he's working in FEDC for peaking into five and six, and he has mm -hmm. been for a few years already and, you know, still struggling with three, you know, some at most times and regulation, of course, at first developmental capacity. So he um, would find it extremely simple if I put Mario characters on the wall to say, touch Mario, touch Luigi. And I heard you say then to increase it. So if I said, touch Mario, then Toad, then Princess Peach, I think mm -hmm. he could do that super easily. Mm -hmm. And then if we added the colors behind it, so say I did like big red circle and I put Princess Peach on it. And then I did big orange circle and put someone else on it. Touch the orange circle. I think he could still do that but it'd be a bit slower. Mm -hmm. And then if I did, you know, two or three step directions um, and for sure he would love the, okay, running to the other side of the room and back. Okay. We're running <laughs> to get the power up Lego piece and we're coming back. Uh, okay. Have, is this a good example? Have your Ma Mario power up, which for those don't know, it's just this little Mario that you turn them on and his stomach has a little screen on it. And when you tap it on the different Lego scanners, it goes bloop, bloop, and it shows something on the stomach. And he's obsessed with these. He loves them so much. So he's always yeah. tapping the scanner. So I'll say, oh, have Mario uh, tap Toad on the shoulder. And then he could make his toy 
touch the wall and have so-and-so do that. Is this the type of thing that you're talking about? Is it too simplistic for someone who's a bit older like this? And third question, yeah. remind us, what is that working on with him? Why would we do this? Definitely not too simplistic. Definitely, this is where we have to use our creative edge to to think about what it is that the student's working on. We have some teachers here who are working with our students and their sight words. And then it's not the picture of Mario, it's the word Mario, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have to point to the word Mario. Um, and they can use Mario to point to the word Mario. Some of our students use like the, the a magic wand or something along those lines to help points. So yes, the more creative we are and the more um, fun we're having, the more fun they're gonna have. And your other question, what are we working on? So you hear something, when you hear the word Mario, touch Mario, you then have to motor plan to touch it, right? When you hear before moving, and this is the important part, when I'm saying touch Mario, then Peach, then Bowser, um, then you have to hold that information, that auditory information in your head to be able to then do that in the sequence. Um, my kids love when they, this is, this is my problem with my affect. My kids love when they get it wrong, right? Because my noise, when you get something wrong is the best noise and they, they want, so then, then they like to fail. And then we have to think of a new, a new, I have to be funny. Okay, so is it something like, eh. it's like, eh. <laughs> and, <laughs> my and son they, would they love, love that, that too. Better. My son would do the wrong thing on purpose to hear that noise. Right. To hear that noise exactly that's a lot of my kids that i'm playing with and they the ding 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 ding, ding isn't, isn't as exciting i guess i don't know i think i have great sound effects but <laughs> um so yeah really thinking about is he working on sight words is he working on, is it a sentence is he putting a paragraph together is it if you scroll down a little bit so this is this is what's really great about the vispa tool is that once I tell parents we're working on magic buttons. This is where we're going to start. Oh, I think you skipped a page. Thinking about what it is that we're, what we're asking our students to do, holding that information and then recalling it. So here's the next game. Do what I say. The, this is about moving things. And so as you get more challenging, you can change the game too, to be more challenging. Um, do what I say. Put the, put the Mario under the foof and lock Bowser in the tent, right? Can they hold on to all of those commands? And then you playing it out with them. Like, I don't just say that and like sit back unless the student has has done it all and they're like, too easy, move on. I'm like, uh-oh, what was first? Uh-oh, what was second? Uh-oh, and and then kind of playing into what what it is that, that their student is working on. Now, what so would you, there's more, I think there's more, even more that we can talk about as far as what's happening, what are they working on? Um, we know that in order to learn, you need executive functioning skills. Yeah. You learn executive functioning skills in your play. And so when you're doing the magic buttons and you're being playful and having a good time, you're also working on working memory, planning, task initiation, so many of our executive functioning skills. So what would you do if, and definitely my son is has challenges with executive functioning. So I, I love the idea of doing this with him and making fun games. What do you do with a child? And, and certainly my son does this a lot with other things. I don't know if he would do it with this game, but he might. He'd be like, I don't know. I need help. I forget. I don't know. Even if he remembers what I said, he just, you know, he, he doesn't want to have to do the hard work. He just kind of wants me to tell him the answer. Do you just like ramp up the fun and like, ah, I forget. What the heck Colleen did I say has, first? Colleen has the best saying for this. <laughs> What's my saying? When you have a chat, when you have a challenge, what do you, you, you say the best thing? Oh, well, that's so nice. Thank you. Now I feel like I'm joking on the spot, but I, I'll often, I go with validation a lot and being playful and like, oh my God, this is so challenging right now. And really playing into um, the joining in the frustration almost 
but then amping up the like, maybe, maybe it's this and maybe I'll get it purposely wrong. So then the student gets to take on like a teaching role almost of like, no, that's not what you said. You let's try this. And then we're able to get into it. So it feels less like a, te- like a demand I'm putting on someone else and something that we're doing together in play versus like, I'm the grown up and you're the student or child or young adult. And then it becomes more of a shared experience where we're both on the same side trying to, you know, complete whatever I've done, like where it's like a magic buttons code and it turns me into a robot. And then if you feel do the code, it turns me into an animal or really just trying to find the, the in for the student. And I, I learned this from like an OT and PT that were teaching a course that we took a couple of years ago. Like if I try something and if it, and it doesn't work. So like, say I'm giving them like a little code to do and it doesn't work. I'm like, okay, that was an assessment and it didn't work so well. But then when I try something else and it is effective, oh, okay, like we're getting somewhere. This is the session. This is the floor time. This is the, for lack of a better word, because I don't love it, but like treatment. So I feel like for parents and anyone listening who's going to attempt to do some of these activities, it doesn't go off without a hitch the first time we do it, typically, you know, ever. Um, But when you give yourself permission to try and it not go well but to keep going till you find what works then the possibilities within the vispa and the games here are kind of endless because there's so i mean you i'm sure you've looked through the packet there is so many activities to choose from and get creative with and yeah. now i'm really curious what tony meant about what <laughs> her so Colleen always she taught me this when you up the challenge or the problem or the hardness of something, you have to balance it out by adding your affect, your playfulness, your silliness, right? Because if you don't, then then the the challenge is, is always going to take over. But mm-hmm. if you can somehow counteract that with your silliness and your playfulness, then then that challenge doesn't take over the the playing takes over and i think that's that's really important when we think about um any kind of therapeutic tool that we're using um if floor time included if you are challenging at those capacities five six four three two whatever it is and you are not in attentive and playing and silly and meeting that child where they are developmentally then the scale is going to tip. It's not going to, it's not going to be what, what you expect. Yes. That is from the whole brain child, which is a great book that I love. And it taught me so much about increasing challenges and increasing support because often in school systems, you see challenges increase and also like sternness and rules increase. And this offers that other perspective of like, pretty much the opposite as challenges increase our support and care should increase as well it sounds almost like the zones of proximal development where you know where's that spot Mm -hmm. that we can identify as this is the spot where the child or the individual needs needs support they need us as the adult to be there to support them in their learning Mm -hmm. and if if listeners either you're watching on youtube or you're listening on audio we've been sharing the screen so that you can see this vispa uh tool tony will this be available for anybody who's listening to the podcast um yeah we can make it available it really is supportive as part of like a therapeutic like this isn't just the intervention or just the thing to do, I think using it in the context of OT, PT, floor time, um, a, a team approach, or having a clinician that can kind of support you on where to start and where to go and things like that would be helpful. But yeah, we can we can make the VISPA available. I, that's not a problem at all. And so if you go to the blog post at affectautism.com, I'm going to link to a bunch of podcasts, like I said, a few minutes back 
Uh, I have a podcast on scaffolding in floor time and Colette referred to the zone of proximal development. And so some of these things that um, you, you may wonder, oh, you know, in passing, you hear these terms, they're described in detail in some other podcasts and blog posts I've done. And um, it's all just so interesting to me because there's, there's so many resources we have to help our children at home instead of them sitting on the screen watching something which is important if we're we need to make dinner and they we you know need some time and and it helps keep them occupied but um you know just giving our kids enriching moments of play and interaction with us and sometimes well very often parents ask me in parent support group uh weekly parent support group that I facilitate at ICDL for those listening that may not know about it it's free uh, event, uh, affectautism.com slash events for the schedule and registration. They'll say like, I, I'm not sure what to do with my child. I'm not sure, um, what to do. I'm not sure how to play. And <laughs> if you're listening to this and you're thinking, I was just wondering this today. Well, here you go. <laughs> here are some activities you can do that really work on movement and that are playful and allow you to sort of have a way to bring out your own genuine affect because, um, while Tony and me both came up with the same bah, like that was our intuitive way of getting it wrong. Someone else might do something else like uh, they might go like, and I'm just making like an X with my arms for those listening on audio. Like you might do visual things like, eh, you know, instead of a sound effect, it might be a visual thing. It might hold up a sign. It might hold up a stop sign or a green light or a red light. Like there's, you can just, um, I just love that you can just, you know, kind of come up with whatever you feel comfortable with as a parent and whatever kinds of things your child is interested in. So I gave the example of Mario because my son's into Mario, but if your son is into Thomas or into some other characters or into, you know, I know I met um, a parent once, once whose child was totally loved everything about elevators. So you bring in the theme of elevators or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and I'm thinking also that many times a therapist will tell a family, you need to work on, uh, you know, each of these different activities and parents go home and think, how do I do that? I think the VISPA provides parents with a framework so that the hard stuff is taken care of for them. Somebody else planned an activity. Now, now you get to do it. And as you add your affect to doing that activity, now this activity is fun and parents feel successful. And what we know is when a parent feels successful, they wanna do it again. And when they're successful again, wow, let's do that again because it really worked. And um, so I think the framework that this provides for families is gonna make it easier for them to plan activities, to find something fun to do together. Yeah, when we used to consult with Dr. Greenspan, he used to recommend thinking goes to school activities two to two to three times a day. He would say, pick an activity and do it. Um, and that's what we do in a lot of our classrooms here. We organize that there are specific times of day where we're doing thinking goes to school activities. Uh, and this it was important for him, right? There, it was important to have that mind-body connection, that that thinking based um playful, but yet somewhat targeted to these sensory systems and integrating the sensory systems with the body and the thinking. So Dr. Greenspan has been recommending this say 20, 20 years ish. Yes. <laughs> um, so we want to, it's important for us to kind of keep that going too, because he believes in it and it, it, it really does make a difference in our students programs. And it, they're little things. It's, you don't have to carve out an hour a day. You can carve out mm -hmm. three to five minutes. Yeah, it feels like there are activities that you could embed into your regular routine. So mm -hmm. like while, I don't know, while you're brushing your teeth in the morning, if you play I Spy and the grown up or caregivers like I Spy something blue and red and then the child like it becomes like a short moment, two minutes where you're actually working on really important thinking skills. And we do that mm. at school with like morning meeting, we have a racetrack in the shape of a lazy eight. So when the kids 
check into school, they bring their car, like they might have a car, they might use their finger or something and trace the lazy eight or do the car around the racetrack mm -hmm. to be like, I'm here today. And now we've completed one thing and goes to school activity in one minute of a routine that is already established and would be happening anyway. Hmm. I love it. Um, now in the VISPA, which is a many page PDF, is there, um, like we gave the example of magic buttons, that might be a an activity that can be simple to a lot more complex, but are the activities in there do they start like super easy and then there's more challenging ones for as the child becomes a pro at the game, let's say, although I guess you can always change the game when they become a pro and make it even more at another challenge. But is there sort of a degree of difficulty? Cause I see, I'm sharing my screen again, for those listening on audio on the, the, there's a game number, the game name, and then it says level. So is that sort of the idea is you work on the level one description, you know, do this and then make it harder in level two, make it harder in level three. And then are there certain activities that like on the, on the right side, it says learning skill targeted. And it says, what is NYS? New York state. Okay. New York state pre-K listening standard, understand and follow oral instructions. So that's, the curriculum that New York State sets out for educators. And then um, if I scroll down, I see here like this skill is concept of perspective. And the next one says develop a concept yeah, so of number sense. We, we put those learning skills targeted on the right hand column was because for a while people were telling us that we weren't do we weren't doing school, we weren't doing academics, and we and we had to kind of we felt like we had to kind of prove that we were. Right. So we took the information and said this actually we do we we are school and we do do <laughs> academics. And here is the research that shows that. So that was kind of our validating. Um, yes, what we're doing is important and here are the reasons why. So the activity is broken up into different categories and depending on what you're what you're targeting to support um, is where is one of those cat categories that you would pick. I mean, how many categories are there, Carl? Is there seven? At least. At least seven, right? Yeah. And it kind of starts, so like, it, the VISPA follows the book a lot. So it kind of starts with these like general movement, what is it called? General movement thinking activities. Oh, there, right there, it says it, general movement. <laughs> And then as you progress through the VISPA, the activities might become more specific. So way further down, you're gonna be looking at like ocular convergence, which is like fancy words for like the eyes coming together and being able to, with the purpose of that area, the thought behind like a student being able to look at a board, look up at a board in front of them, read what's on there, focus their eyes onto one word, and then turn back to their paper, readjust their eyes and copy something down. So that you might, I think it's a guide and we use it as a guide, but you would work with your team or whoever, maybe your OT, your teacher, the family, and identify areas where you might see challenges and then I think you would pull from several of the of the areas so you might work on some general movement while also working on auditory thinking games or um discriminative movements where you're looking for more specific movement from from the child instead of moving as like a whole body if that makes sense yes it, it's it's wonderful. Um, I wish that every single school used this guide and referred to thinking goes to school. Uh, we get Colleen we, and and Tony. Do you wait until a child is at a certain FEDC before you start these activities? No, regulation is. Uh, 
is important. So I would say to be regulated, right? We don't want to intrude anybody's space, even though it's a hands-off approach. We still don't want to be intrusive of someone's space if they're dysregulated or they're still acclimating to their environment. I mean, second week of school, we, we're we not saying, hey, here's your thinking, go to school plan and, and let's, let's mm -hmm. get on it. We want to make sure that our students feel safe and connected. Um, and the the more safe and connected they feel, the easier it is to kind of implement these activities into their yeah. program. And I do feel like we do take this the approach of like thinking is regulating at times and it's more of an invitation to join in an activity than a demand. So the invitation remains and we might start really small with like, um, like even with magic buttons, if we're using that as an example today, like where we have a picture of the student and a picture of the classmate and we're like, where's your picture as part of our like initial assessing, mm -hmm. again, could be embedded into a morning meeting um, so that they're, they're invited into the thinking games, but without, without pressure. On mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, this is so helpful. I think that a lot of people are going to be asking for a copy and get started on it. I feel like we should have a parent group where we just pick out activities, work on them and report back to each other about it. And Absolutely. I certainly am looking forward to doing this with my son. And for me, it, if if parents are listening, it, it, to me, I think it's the same thing as saying, oh, okay, once the school year starts, I'm going to start my exercise program. And I have all these videos online of, you know, these workouts that I'm going to do 25 minute workouts. Uh, well, I haven't done one yet. So <laughs> like you want to do all these activities with your kids and you say you're going to do it, but you actually have to schedule the time and do it. So um, I'm going to try and be a motivator for parents to, for us to do it together so that we motivate each other. Just like when you have an exercise partner and you go to the gym together, you're more likely to go. <laughs> And as a clinician, I think that we as clinicians do a terrible job when we give information to parents and say, do this sensory diet or do this movement thing, because it's your whole day goes by and you're like, I didn't do one of the things that that therapist told me to do, because you have to really understand families routines and patterns in order to be able to to implement them. Right. I like to say like Colleen said, when you brush your teeth, you do one thinking goes to school activity, right? Mm -hmm. Make it very concrete when you're changing for when I work, when I do EI and little kids, when you're changing your child's diaper, when the diaper comes, the new diapers on, you're going to do this activity for one minute. You really have to figure out when those things are going to happen. My favorite time at home with my kids is when we're putting on our shoes to leave the house because it is disorganizing for me. I feel like I'm getting it overwhelmed by trying to get out and everyone's all over the place and we sit down and we put the shoes out and we do a thinking goes to school activity touch the red shoe the blue shoe the this the that before we leave the house figuring out ways to like get it into your schedule so that way it's not the day went by and everybody has great intentions me as a parent and me as a clinician but if you don't find those those two to three minutes a few times a day the whole day is gone and you're like oh I didn't do those I just put my kids to bed and um, all the latest research on habits says exactly that. Like you pair up a habit that you already do with something new to make it a new habit. So I love that. Yeah. Thank you for that tip. And maybe at, at the parent support meetings, you could pick one thinking goes to school activity, explain it, at, at, you know, offer some ways to expand it or to make it more personalized. And now parents might practice that particular task or that particular activity mm -hmm. I, I it's all forming in my head right now like getting parents to commit to what are you going to do with your child because I told you what I'm going to do I'm going to put Mario characters up on colored circles and we're going to do this and increase the intensity by doing this and this is what are you going to pick and then I'll mm -hmm. get them to commit down and have the idea ready so that part of it's already done when they leave the group and and what habit are you going to pair it with brushing teeth or, you know, um, right before you eat, like, oh, before we eat, you know, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking like, it'd be cool if everybody had like colored plates and forks or something where you could like pair it in with that or whatever it is. 
<laughs> yeah, before you sit down at the table, lazy eight is an infinity sign. Call it lazy because it's on its side. Um, Trace, you can have it hanging on a wall. Trace your eight with your fork before you sit down. That's how we're going to get started for dinner. Something just making it part of that routine can be so, it's it, an easier way to end. And I, and you mentioned earlier, Tony, painter's tape. I love painter's tape. And if there's a hallway to get to the kitchen where the meal time is, then we trace yeah. you know, a repeated V or we trace circles. As we're walking down the hallway, our finger is touching that painter's tape and following the pattern to get us to where, you know, to the kitchen, to the table. Yeah, and that was one of Dr. Greenspan's. I got that from him too. He used to tell us when the students loved something so much and they were excited to see it in the morning when they came into school to tape it to the wall, right? Because then you have to use your visual, your visual um, attention and your fine motor skills have to work together. And then you love that thing that's on the wall. And and it's not like, oh, I put this thing and that's mean. It's like, oh, who did that last night? Who came in here? Was it Bowser that taped Mario to the wall? And we have to we have to get him out, right? And you have to use your fine motor, your visual motor to kind of work, mm -hmm. that, work that together. I always blame somebody else. I don't know who my kids think comes in the middle of the night into our house. I was <laughs> like, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, I love it. Thank you. Um, is there any last thing that we forgot to say that anyone wanted to add, Colleen? Maybe have fun. Yes. Hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Excellent. The activities are definitely fun. Make them that way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here. Again, everybody, look at affectautism.com. You can look up VISPA, V I S P A to go to the blog post about what we're talking about. Lots of links to different resources. And I can't wait to meet up with you all again and have you at Parent Support as guests to walk through this with our parents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get 15% off any DIR 101 course and introduction to DIR and DIR floor time through ICDL.com by using the promo code Affect A15. That's A F F E C T A 1 5. Until next time, here's to choosing play and experiencing joy every day.